Thank you, Raheem. And uh, thank you to UCLA students for justice in Palestine, uh, law students for justice in Palestine, as well as the panelists that uh, I'll be introducing shortly. Um, the panelists will be speaking for uh, about 15 minutes each, and then we will open up to uh, Q&A, for which uh, we hope will be a, a fruitful discussion on the question of boycott, divestment, and sanctions. Um, as a procedural matter, uh, just to be clear, um, the university has been in touch with us about potential disturbances to this event, and so for those members of the audience that would seek to do so, we would simply tell you that you will receive one warning um, to refrain from disturbing the event, after which uh, we have certain procedures that will have to uh, take effect. And I would ask members of the audience to not engage with anyone who might consider to disrupt this event. Um, I'd also like to say as a graduate student at UCLA and in the Los Angeles area that I'm very proud to uh, be surrounded by faculty members, scholars, and public intellectuals that have taken the stances that these individuals on this panel have. I'm not so proud of being uh, under a university administration that has unfortunately created several bureaucratic hurdles for the implementation of this event and has shown no signs of such bureaucratic hurdles for hosting events that feature Israeli soldiers or mayors from Israeli settlements uh, here at the law school and elsewhere on campus. So um, thank you to all of you for doing what you do. I'll introduce the uh, panelists in the order that they will be speaking, um, and then turn it over to them. <clears throat> First, we'll be hearing from Gabriel, Gabriel Peterberg, who is a professor of history in the UCLA Department, uh, in the UCLA Department of History. He writes and teaches on the history of the Ottoman Empire and the Mediterranean in the early modern period, as well as on modern themes like settler colonialism, Zionism, and Palestine Israel. He writes for the New Left Review and London Review of Books. Dr. Peterberg studied at Tel Aviv University and Oxford. After Dr. Peterberg, we will be hearing from Robin Kelly, Professor of History at the UCLA Department of History. He is the Gary B. Nash Professor of American History. While much of his work has focused on the social and cultural history of African Americans in the United States, he recently returned from an extended trip to Palestine, which he will be speaking to us tonight. Third, Professor Sandra Hale from the Department of Anthropology at UCLA. Her work focuses, and women's studies, excuse me. Her work focuses on gender and political economy in the Middle East, particularly in the Sudan. She was the editor of the Journal of Middle East Women's Studies between 2005 and 2009. This past December, Professor Hale was awarded the Lifetime Scholarly Achievement Award from the Association of Middle East Women's Studies. In addition, this past July, she received an award from the leading feminist NGO in Sudan for, quote, 50 years of commitment to and support of the Sudanese women's movement, end quote. And finally, we have Professor David Lloyd, from the University of Southern California, where he has been teaching in the English and Comparative Literature Department since 2003. He has primarily published on themes of colonialism and nationalism in Irish literature and culture. He is also an organizing member for the U.S. Campaign for the Academic and Cultural Boycott of Israel, which uh, Professor Hale and Professor Kelly are also members, organizing members of. He has also made numerous media appearances about his work on the campaign. I'll now turn it over to our panelists. Uh, Professor Peterberg. Well, thank you very much, uh, Ziad, for the kind introduction. I'm not sure it's working. Mm -hmm. really close to us. Okay, is it better? Yeah. Okay, so um, this is not my first time uh, speaking at the Palestine Awareness Week, nor in the uh, events uh, in Toronto and Oxford in the past on uh, the Israel Apartheid Week. And whenever I do so, I remember um, Edward Said's last words, which, which were um, sort of uh, a will to all of us not to forget Palestine. So we are here to say that um, we haven't forgotten and we never shall. Um, so now, what I want to do is uh, set, get started uh, this panel by 
giving an overview of the history of the conflict in two ways. One will be more conventional, historical, and brief, and the other one more literary. And to begin with the historical, um, the framework within which um, the history of Palestine, Israel should be understood is that of comparative settler colonialism, as I've already said and written on several occasions. Settler colonialism is the lesser known, although with time much less lesser known, form of colonialism which is usually associated with the better known form of metropole colonialism, for which British India is an example in which a European uh, power after 1500 invaded uh, one of the non-white European parts of the world, took control of it and ruled it with ma mainly military and, administ and administrative means and exploited it as much as it could in several ways, economic, strategic and so forth. But once the anti-colonial movement was successful, the colonizer left not to return. The other form of colonialism, settler colonialism, was accompanied by white settlers who in all sorts of ways and forms settled in many of these colonies and sought to carve for themselves with time a national patrimony in the country in which they had settled. And that involved a conflict both with the native indigenous population and the metropole power. There have been in history three possible results of this configuration. One is a complete victory of the settlers in which the metropole power was sent packing and with dire consequences for the native population which was, which was basically exterminated and if not exterminated irrevocably removed and stopped playing a significant political part even if it remained within the territory that now became a settler state. The US, Australia and Argentina are outstanding examples for this case. Another case which was a case in which the settlers turned out to be not powerful enough and were eventually driven out in a long drawn and bloody uh, anti-colonial struggle. The outstanding cases for this are uh, French Algeria and British Kenya. There was a third possibility in which the settlers won initially but could not prevent later on uh, uh, an indigenous reassertion as happened in South Africa first and foremost but also Rhodesia, Zimbabwe. Palestine, Israel is an interesting case which is falls within this general framework but has remained unresolved because on the one hand, the settlers have won and the indigenous people have been ethnically cleansed and put under um, all kinds of repressive regimes of either military rule or occupation in the occupied territories. Yet at the same time, despite a, 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 a growing exponential, exponentially growing asymmetry of power between um, the settlers and their state and the indigenous population the settlers thus far have not been able to translate it into an irrevocable removal of the indigenous population despite several tribes which I'll mention in a few seconds. The reason or the, the fact that the settlers have not been irrevocably successful in removing the indigenous people is the reason why we are here. Um, otherwise, we could have been doing something else. Um, <laughs> and the two, to, to give an overview of the main stations in which this happened, I think the first station has to be demographic and has to go to the period before 48, the pre-state or the pre-state of Israel period, in which if you look it's, it's, they are convenient dates, hence why I'm mentioning them. At the demography of Palestine in 1918, you have, roughly speaking, 60,000 Jews and 700,000 Arabs. 
1938, this is 1918, a year after the British had conquered Palestine and uh, drove out the Ottoman Empire. Twenty years later, in 1938, uh, in the depth of the Arab revolt, you have million, slightly more than a million Palestinian Arabs and 460,000 Jews. At that point, the presence of the Jews becomes irrevocable in Palestine, and this is one of the major turning points, in my view, in the development of this colonial or settler colonial conflict between a national movement of white settlers, Zionism, and a reactive national movement of the indigenous Palestinians. Um, the Zionist colonization of Palestine and settlement there had begun in 1882 through several waves. I should mention one critical transformation in a second, but to go back to the major events, after their arrival, in my view, the major event, the first major event that needs mentioning is the 1936-1939 Arab Revolt, which is insufficiently understood because in the suppression of that revolt, ruthless suppression of the revolt, by possibly the largest anti-colonial revolt in the colonial world in the first half of the 20th century, the British broke the back of the Palestinian society. And by the time we come to 47-49, which is the real period of the 48 war, the Palestinian community is basically, I'm, I'm talking in cold and measured, um, unemotional terms, the Palestinian community had been done in, basically, and was not able to begin with, to deal with the onslaught of the civil war that erupted in Palestine before 15 of May 48, which is the end of the British mandate, and the official stage of the 48 war between the Arab armies and what was now the IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces. Now, the result of this 48 war was the formation of the State of Israel and a massive ethnic cleansing of at least 750,000 Palestinians from their homes, basically thus far with no return. I know it's contentious, I know the numbers are contentious, I know of course the right of return is a major, but thus far their return has been completely uh, made impossible and in this sense, uh, again, the settlers are still winning. The next crucial stage, of course, was the 67 war, which uh, created a change in the settler situation because now the settler state, i.e. Israel, was not only a victorious settler state within the territory on which it was created, it also started to create its own colonies as a sort of metropole uh, in the occupied territories. And I think what we have been seeing since 1967 with the addition of the whole of Western Palestine or with the coming of the whole of Western Palestine under Israel control is this unresolved um, settler situation in which the settlers are becoming stronger, exponentially more powerful than the indigenous people, yet nonetheless they are incapable of translating this asymmetry of power into the final removal of, uh, of the indigenous Palestinians. At the same time, so what is happening from a settler perspective is a frustrating, exponential, exponentially growing asymmetry of power which cannot be translated into the final removal, which they have the power to do, the military and other sorts of power they have to do. And at the same time, they cannot bring themselves to see the Palestinians who are there and for the time being cannot be removed as equal human beings, either individually or collectively. And if you ask me to summarize what is it about the Palestinians that bothers the Israelis? It's not their terrorism, it's not their resistance, it's not their different culture, it's their presence. It's their mere presence. That's fundamentally what has bothered the Zionist, early Zionist settlers and has continued to bother them since the creation of the, of the State of Israel and for the foreseeable future. And I think this is underlain by the basic 
kind of settler colony, which is one of them, but the main one in my view, which we call pure settlement, pure settlement colony, in which the settlers do not want indigenous labor, but they want the land. This is the, the, the type of colony that was created in North America in the 17th century. This is the type of colony that was created in Australia. In this particular land labor formation, the, the natives are superfluous from a settler point of view because their labor is not needed and what is needed is their land. In this formation, their presence is the problem, not what they do. Let me quickly move to the literature and I'll skip what I had wanted to do. I had wanted to start with, in order to show to you two things, A, the continuity from 48 until today, and B, in a way, my own position, which I sometimes think is typical of uh, Albert Memis, memorable term, the colonizer who refuses. And I continue to refuse, but sometimes I have the feeling that it's futile, as Memis says. And, uh, the colonizers who refuse don't achieve all that much. So I was going to start with a war story by Essie Har, a famous Israeli author who fought in the 48 war, and in 49 wrote a story called The Prisoner. And the story is of an Arab shepherd who is picked up by an Israeli detachment for no good reason, is tortured, is uh, then sent after his torturing and after he can give no information because he doesn't know anything, is sent to a prisoner's camp and the narrator who is his heart himself uh, struggling with the attempt to let him go with his desire to do the human thing and say let's we are passing by his village let's release him which he doesn't because this position of the colonizer who refused is so paralyzing so i'm not reading from this but i will read from an incident that was unearthed by Haaretz correspondent Heim Levinson a few weeks ago of something that happened in 2008. And what happened in 2008, in May 2008, is the following, I'm quoting from Levinson in Haaretz. In May 2008, Omar Abu Jriban, a Palestinian who was not authorized to enter Israel, was seriously injured in an accident while riding a stolen car. He was prematurely discharged from Shiva Medical Center, Tel Shomer, into the custody of Rehoboth police officers near Tel Aviv, with a urinary catheter still in place, still using adult diapers, in need of further medical care and rehabilitation, and appearing confused. When the Israeli prison service hospital said it had no room for him, officers from the Rehoboth station drove him into the West Bank. They eventually put him down late at night at the side of the road near the Offer military base, which is west, west of Jerusalem. His body was discovered two days later. Abu Shriban had died of dehydration. The Israeli uh, author, David Grossman, wrote a few days ago in Aretz a big piece on the absolute horror from that and end, ends it thus. I know that they, ironically, I know that they represent neither the police, the police officers who just dropped the person to die uh, on the, near the wall, actually. I know that they represent neither the police nor the society or the state. I know that this is just the fraction or the rotten apples or the bad weeds. But then I think a people that has been dumping another whole people on the roadside for 45 years and has been successful in creating for themselves a not at all bad life, accompanied by a marvelously sophisticated, genial denial of their responsibility for the situation, and in addition have managed to ignore the meaning of the distortion and madness they have created during those years for their own way of life. Why should such a people be shocked by one such omen? And finally, from another war story that was written again in 1949 by the same Essie's heart, called the story of Gilbert Hiza, in which he told from his own war experience the ethnic cleansing of the village called Gilbert Hiza. And towards the end of the story, uh, a comrade of his heart senses his, his unease with the narrator uh, of the whole situation, and this guy's name, the comrade, is Moishe. And Moishe says to the narrator, just you listen to what I'm saying. Moishe's eyes sought mine as he spoke. Immigrants of ours will come to this Hilbe, what's its name? You will, you hear me? 
and they'll take this land and work it, and it will be beautiful here. And then the narrator responds, of course, absolutely, why hadn't I realized it from the outset? Our very own Khirbat Hiza, questions of housing and problems of absorption, and hooray, with house and absorbed and how, we'd open a cooperative store, establish a school, maybe even a synagogue. There would be political parties here. They debate all sorts of things. They would plow fields and sow and reap and do great things. Long, li long live Hebrew Chilbet Hiza. Who then would ever imagine that once there had been some Chilbet Hiza that we emptied out and took for ourselves? We came, we shot, we burned, we blew up, expelled, drove out, and sent to exile. I want to finish on a more optimistic note, which is given what's happening in the Arab world with all its problems and with all its violence. Uh, maybe it's time to dust off what until recently seemed obsolete slogans and say, Thaura, Thaura, Haka, Thank you. Children 
in prison for stolen phone. Um, in Israeli military courts, Palestinian children, um, basically age 12, are tried as adults who can be detained for 90 days without access to an attorney. Uh, and you know, before I get into the horrors we saw, let me talk about what was really inspiring about the trip. So I think that's where I want to be uh, from. Part of what made this significant was our direct engagement with Palestinian intellectuals who, uh, in my view, are you know, some, some of the most brilliant minds on the planet are here at Beersdale University, um, or are um, uh, Palestinian Israeli uh, scholars at Haifa, who met at um, Mada El Kamal, the Arab Center for Applied Social Research. Um, we met scholars at Muwatin, the Palestinian Institute for Social Democracy, which actually pretty much sponsored our trip to organize some sessions. And what's interesting about that trip, we first met the president of Khalil, the president of um, Birzet, Khalil Hindi, who not only affirmed his support for BDS, but he insisted that the one issue on campus that united everyone, with, with a few exceptions, was support for boycott events, drive divestment sanctions. Um, and that's from a university president. You know, uh, a university that has a history of being shut down and closed by, um, by, by Israel a university that has a history uh, in which one of the presidents was actually abducted <laughs> by the IDF. That's a whole other story uh, which we could talk about. Um, but it's a different, different kind of place. So that, that was exciting. Uh, we also met with faculty there at Berzette. And in our conversations, we had a spirited discussion about the effect of this support time um, as strategy, its possibilities, its limits. Um, what we took away from those conversations wasn't just um, some in incredible thinkers in terms of uh, some of the very things that, that uh, Gabi was, was sharing with you. Um, you know, the nature of settler colonialism, the impact it has, social, psychological, um, uh, economic. Um, but we not only learned from that, but we also learned about the, the huge sort of war on education a waged against Palestinians. Um, and that academic freedom was one of the main issues. In fact, there's already a boycott. A boycott has been going on against Palestinian intellectuals uh, for, for decades. Um, and I won't talk about that because um, uh, even his wonderful paper uh, after me uh, by Professor Sandra Hill, which I had the pleasure of reading, is just fantastic. So you should not read. Um, <laughs> um, but the other space that was really exciting for us at least for me, another intellectual space, the space of, of political and intellectual engagement were refugee camps. Specifically, um, the uh, Aida a refugee camp in just north of Bethlehem, to Bethlehem in, in Jerusalem, where uh, I met uh, the founder of the Arawad Cultural Center, or the Theater Center of Society, uh, Abdul Fattis Abu Sor who well, I'm actually bringing to this campus on April 24th, so make sure you don't miss that. Um, and meeting some of the young people who, who basically grew up in refugee camps, and the way they're thinking about the, the Palestinian struggle as a global struggle for not just self-determination, but for democracy. The way they're rethinking democracy. Now I'm talking about not just teenagers, not just young adults, but little kids. You know? So these spaces you know, that, that actually look like prisons, Spaces in which you could barely walk between buildings and where holes are in uh, people's dwellings because the IDF is used to build, tearing the holes in people's houses to get from apartment to apartment to find um, uh, uh, suspected so-called terrorists or whatever. Uh, to, see, to see people living in those conditions but also really thinking about and engaging in a level of, of analysis is equal to anything my own students uh, are doing here at UCLA or at USC. So that's something I think we have to pay attention to. Uh, I saw the same thing at the Balata refugee camp in Nablus, which is one of the most um, uh, populated uh, refugee camps in, in the West Bank, which again is like a prison. Uh, okay, now, uh, our delegation you know, cross checkpoints by foot, uh, either one from Ramallah to East Jerusalem, uh, and realized very quickly that most of our colleagues at Birzet 
uh, could not go with us because they didn't have the proper papers uh, to travel to, to East Jerusalem, um, which again is a, uh, not to, it's an assault on uh, not just freedom of movement, but academic freedom in many ways. Um, we, of course, had to deal with the apartheid wall with its 500 checkpoints dispersed throughout the area, uh, which systematically denies Palestinians direct access to schools, medical facilities, as well as their own farms. Um, just to give you some numbers here, uh, approximately 55,000 Palestinian residents in East Jerusalem are physically separated from the urban center by the Bay Area. Um, and you know, what would be like a short walk, for example, to school can take you know, several hours. And standing on the roof of one of the buildings in the Aida refugee camp, and, you know, which is right abuts the wall between sort of Bethlehem and Jerusalem. And to realize that you could actually see, you know, not just the Gilo um, settlement up on top of the hill, which is harassing Palestinians at the bottom of the hill, but you could see Palestinian homes, you could I mean, literally throw a rock over the wall, and those children cannot get past that wall to the UN school. They have to travel like an hour and a half to get around it, to get it every single day. I mean, it's just amazing. And one of the, this is sort of a side note, but um, in this piece I have coming out, I talk about the absurdity of, um, of walking on Jerusalem and seeing um, uh, all these um, uh, recycling containers, high tech, you know. They're trying to make a green Israel in a place where um, they're destroying olive trees as, as an act of war, where they're requiring Palestinians to travel miles and miles to get from place to place. So you're not really interested in the, in the green Israel. <laughs> I mean, it's like, it's the totally opposite of what, what you would think. So to me, that's pretty interesting. Um, okay, we want to Hebron. I, I don't need to, um, to say much about that because, uh, you know, you, everyone I've seen videos, uh, our walking tour, though, was fascinating to, to walk in the main market and to see uh, steel wire placed over the soup, over the, the main market because settlers who had colonized the um, uh, apartments overlooking uh, the main market would throw refuse and rocks and eggs and, 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 and um, human waste onto merchants to try to drive them out. Uh, and we, that. we also witnessed Jim Crow straight up where uh, you know the settlers have a road they walk on, a wide road, and all the Palestinians, you know, who make up the vast majority of people in Hebron uh, walk down a narrow sidewalk. And to see that and to see it police was kind of amazing. Um, my time is very short, so I'm going to skip over a bunch of stuff. And I won't but this is what I would have talked about. I would have talked about Sheikh Jarrah and, and, and meeting the Hanun family, the Al Dawi family, who had been um, displaced, evicted by, in the middle of the night, November 2008, August 2009, uh, by the Israeli police and, and what that meant. Um, and I would have talked about um, East Jerusalem. Let me say two things about East Jerusalem and then. And, 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 um, just some uh, some numbers here. Um, actually, forget the numbers. Jewish settlements in East Jerusalem, you know, uh, have really been knitted together and linked to the western half of the city by um, state-of-the-art light rail system built by the French transportation uh, giant Yolia. And I want to sort of use this opportunity to talk about. Um, the Dump Veolia uh, campaign. Uh, sure neglects here and she has some other material. Uh, they're having a big rally March 30th, 2012 um, uh, at Ellis City Hall. Can you say something about Veolia? Um, the fact that you have a light rail system in occupied territory, that itself is illegal. Uh, it is a violation of the hate convention because you can't have infrastructure in occupied territory that, that benefits, that, that really doesn't benefit the occupied population or serves as a military purpose. Um, the other thing is that Veolia has a, uh, a, a trash dump in West Bank's uh, Jordan Valley, which is used for waste produced by, within Israel as well as in the settlements, in violation, again, of international law. 
Uh, and as some of you may know, LA has a contract with Builder to run the downtown dash bus. So don't take the dash bus. And also go to the rally and protest. It's pretty ridiculous. And let me just close with some, some thoughts. I mean, I have lots I could say about describing the trip, but let me just a couple of thoughts about what all this means. Based on that experience, based on what I've read, based on my conversations with uh, many people on this panel, uh, who I think are geniuses on this question, you know, you quickly learn that much of the opposition to BDS is not about occupation at all. Uh, indeed, as Ilan Kaffe said the other day, in his talk, and others have said this many, many times, the occupation has actually become something of a burden for Israel. Despite the fact that the cost of occupation has been shouldered by the Palestinians themselves, which is the genius of creating the Palestinian Authority. Rather, there's a perennial problem of expanding settlement in the occupied territories without annexing these areas. Because once you do that, once you annex these areas, you have to deal with people. Palestinians come with it. And the dilemma has always been, I think, and this is exactly what, what Gabi was saying, you know, it's, a, it's, it's, it's about the presence, the presence of Palestinians. And the, the dilemma has always been, how do you create a land without a people when there are people there? Hence, um, some manifestation of the Nakba, of, of the um, ethnic cleansing, uh, or just the, the realities of the colonialism persist to this day. <coughs> this, of course, brings up the demographic threat idea, the, the, the real heart of the matter, which is to maintain a Jewish majority. And this is why, among right and left, the law of return is sacrosanct, while the right of return is heresy. Right? Um, and on this question, this is where even the most sophisticated intellectuals some of my colleagues seem to check their critical faculties at the door. But too many assume a kind of fixed, unified identity among, among Jews, and that the same applies to Palestinians. You know, while it is true that surveys have shown a hardening of anti-Arab attitudes in Israel, including among the younger generation, there is also growing evidence of Israelis considering and even embracing a binational state, or some one-state solution that allows for equal rights, religious freedom, and full citizenship under constitutional democracy. Um, and of course, by Israelis, who are Israelis? Israelis meaning Arabs, Israelis also you know, Muslims, Christians, Mizrahi, Jews, um, who have suffered their share of discrimination among the Bedouins, who don't have any rights, basically. So what does this mean? It means that, you know, when I look out in the audience, I see members of Jewish Voice for Peace, which is here, and always struggling for the right thing. Um, it means that the struggle is not simply a demographic. It's not about bodies or religion, but it's about ideas. A different vision of the future. If we compare Israel-Palestine with other settler colonial societies, we have to recognize that every regime was brought down or transformed, not by the colonizers alone, but through a united front, both with dissident elements among the settlers, as well as global solidarity movements. And because the status quo could not govern without undermining the safety, liberties, and privileges of settler society. So remember, Walls have two sides, and the militarization of Israeli society affects everyone differently, of course, but no one is immune. Recall that the Nationalist Party was defeated in South Africa by the UDF, United Democratic Front, which was comprised of Africans, colors, Indians, and white people. Or in the Portuguese colonies, where the cause of colonial war led to a coup that toppled Salazar regime and ended colonial rule. So as I end, and you know, let's, let's think about BDS as a movement, not just as a kind of act, but as a conversation, to use Ilan Pape's uh, description, a conversation that could produce a new idea of the future in which everyone's involved and everyone's complicit. Generational struggles are really uh, very important. Robin reminded me uh, this evening, and, and the, when, we were both, when we both came in, that I was one of the founding editors of Ufahama, the African Activist Association uh, Journal, Radical Journal, in the 1960s, early 70s. Um, Robin uh, was on the editorial board um, and editor in the 1980s. And the current editor of Ufahamu is in the audience right now, my editor, and I think that's pretty, uh, pretty impressive. 
um, that we can carry on these progressive struggles intergenerationally. Makes me feel old, but other than that, um, my uh, presentation actually has a title. I always like to uh, give titles because it keeps me organized. Um, the title is Academic Freedom, DBS, and the Responsibility of Academics and Public Intellectuals. I'm speaking, as uh, Ziad um, had said, um, as one of the founding members and formerly part of the organizing committee of the U.S. Um, Committee for an Academic and Cultural Boycott of Israel. I'll be referring to it as the U.S. Committee. Okay. <laughs> Um, this organization sprang from um, California Scholars for Academic Freedom, which is an organization that I still coordinate. I mention California Scholars for Academic Freedom because we are kept especially busy responding to the violations of the academic freedom of people of Middle Eastern descent or scholars of, Mid of Middle East studies uh, within and without the U.S. Academy more than any other cases. I wonder why. As we know, um, the U.S. Academic and Cultural Boycott Committee is only one of many that are springing up all over the, uh, all over the world. But what sets the U.S. Committee aside from most is that we're working within the bastion of support for Israel anywhere in the world. The U.S. Committee follows what, uh, what PACV um, calls for or takes the position that Israeli <coughs> academic institutions that are mostly state controlled and the vast majority of Israeli intellectuals and academics have either contributed directly to maintaining, defending, or otherwise justifying various forms of oppression or have been complicit in them through their silence. Israeli universities are not these innocent uh, institutions that we're picking on, in other words. Now, the U.S. government and much of the U.S. public are, as we all know, among the bastions of opposition to any kind of boycott of Israel. And I have to add UCLA, unfortunately, add UCLA to that list. UCLA has been one of the bastions of opposition to any kind of progressive uh, movement with regard to changing um, the Israeli government policies as, as, any, as maybe a handful of other universities in the country. Um, so this is a university where we have to work on change from within, not only change from without. And uh, some of you know that, that uh, California, three presidents of the California State University system signed a very, very impressive letter calling for academic freedom in the face of Zionist uh, aggression towards people who were fighting on behalf of uh, Palestinians. Um, so what I suggest in terms of working from within is that we put enormous pressure on our administration to also stand up for us when our uh, for those of us who are fighting on behalf of Palestinians, stand up for our academic freedom, make a statement, and have some courage. Now, academics are among the people that have uh, attempted to violate the academic freedom of others who have spoken up on behalf of Palestine, blindly following a Zionist lobby that argues that an academic boycott of Israel would fly in the face of academic freedom. And I contend that that's a spurious argument, a false argument. I ask if such an argument makes the concept of academic freedom meaningless. Is there something sacred about academia that somehow supposedly transcends other values and morals that many academic freedom defenders profess to care about, that is namely justice and human rights? Why would Israelis such as Ilan Pape, Nevi Gordon, and Amira Haas, to name only a few, call for an academic boycott. And I think I can put uh, Gabby Peterberg in that, in that lot as well. Uh, why would these Israelis uh, be calling for an academic boycott? Um, and just as some academics like me call for an academic boycott, 
of U.S. academic institutions during the war in Vietnam. However, when we call for an institutional, academic, and cultural boycott of Israeli universities and government-sponsored cultural institutions, it seems to raise the wrath of Zionists even more than a call for an economic boycott. And as a consequence, it endangers us, those of us in academic institutions, and Israelis, Israeli dissidents in um, Israeli institutions. In 2006, I prepared a paper entitled, If Ever There Was a Time, Academic Boycotts and Societies in Crisis, that I was supposed to deliver at an international conference in Bellagio, Italy. Uh, the name of the conference was Principles in, po in Politics, Academic Boycotts and Perspective, a conference to discuss the AAUP Statement Principle. It was organized by AAUP, the um, American Association of University Professors, which is sort of our loose advisory uh, group, organ, and was sponsored by Ford and Rockefeller Foundations. I never delivered the paper, nor did any of my pro-boycott colleagues, because the conference was canceled less than a week before it was to be held. Israeli universities and their U.S. lobbyists threatened Rockefeller and Ford, and funding was withdrawn. Just like that. It seems that Israeli lobbyists were afraid even to discuss academic boycotts. Even if the academic discussion was sponsored by a liberal organization, the AAUP, that had already taken a stand against academic boycotts, still uh, we weren't allowed to discuss it. I ask you, who were the violators of academic freedom? Now, academics are a strange lot. Um, Many U.S. academics want to think of themselves um, or ourselves as public intellectuals, which is a kind of romantic term. But some of these same people shy away from the responsibility of standing up to what the U.S. government is doing to Palestinians, not to mention Iraq, uh, Iraqis and um, Afghans, of, of course, and also what the U.S. government directly and indirectly is doing to education in Palestine. Where are the public intellectuals on this issue? But we do have a changing context. This is a time when many in the US and elsewhere are discussing whether or not we need to transform the concept of academic freedom to address the changing political climate and therefore the changing nature of universities. Many of us are asking how much academic freedom we have in US universities anyway, considering that, that that institutions of higher education have been increasingly subjected to surveillance, intervention, and control. Changes wrought by the commercialization and privatization of the university, which make the production of knowledge for the public good increasingly difficult. And I would say that UCLA is certainly not an exception to the commercialization and uh, privatization of the university. No matter how we define academic freedom, we still need to ask if this academic freedom makes any sense in the context of Israel, the site of occupation and conflict, and also in the absence of critiques of professional norms, national identity, and hierarchical power relations. Likewise, what does it mean within the U.S. to refer to such an abstract freedom as academic freedom in the face of the U.S. Patriot Act? or the war on terrorism, so-called war on terrorism, and the incessant assaults on the public university is really the last bastion of critical inquiry in the United States. We're forced to ask, in observing both the US and Palestinian cases, whose freedom are we supposed to be defending? Is it the freedom of Israeli academics to support their academic institutions that engage and enter into contracts with impunity to serve the very scientific and industrial might that leads to an apartheid state and to the militarization of society? I ask, is this the kind of academic freedom we're supposed to be defending? The very institutions that study the colonized in order to control them better, is that the academic freedom that we're defending? Are we being asked to support the freedom of Israeli institutions to oppress Palestinians with impunity? 
and to support Israeli universities which are violating the academic freedom of their own faculty who oppose government policies of oppression and racism toward Palestinians. Academics like Elan Pape have virtually been run out of Israel. There are moral imperatives here. How can we discuss academic freedom in the absence of basic human rights? Is it like supporting peace without justice? More explicitly, how can we take a so-called neutral position that purports to protect the academic freedom, ergo human rights, of both Israeli institutions and academics and Palestinians in the occupied territories? Who is protecting the academic freedom of Palestinian institutions and academics and of Israeli dissenters who support them? The portrait is clear. Palestinian education was already an endangered species in the West Bank and Gaza. And then the assault on Gaza was perhaps the nail in the coffin for education in the Gaza. Through the assault on Gaza schools, through all of this, there was no outcry whatsoever from Israeli universities. As Elan Pape has reminded us, and I quote him, never in its history did the Senate of any Israeli university pass a resolution protesting the frequent closures of Palestinian universities, let alone voice protest over the devastation uh, sowed there during the last uprising. Israeli academia continues to do practically nothing to bring the facts to public attention." End of quote. All the while that education in Palestine is being devastated, Israeli academics continue to collaborate in contracts and projects that build the military machinery. In fact, through all of the withholding of education from Palestinians, Israeli academics continue to enjoy material advantages internationally, visiting teaching posts, scholarships, having their articles published in international journals, getting their books published, receiving general academic funding and travel at will, and still we are not calling for an academic boycott of individuals. These very individuals that in fact take money from a government that supports the militarization of the society and the devastation of the education of Palestinians. We are not asking for an individual boycott. We're asking for an institutional boycott. And we always have to make that clear. Shaheen Alam argues, as do many, that Israeli educational institutions, as arms of the state, are serving the state through their links with the military, the political parties, the media, and the economy. Or, as Mona Baker claims, Israeli academic and research institutions are a major source of prestige, legitimacy, and income for Israel. Whose academic freedom is being supported? Where are the U.S. public intellectuals when we need them most? Academics should use any nonviolent measures at our disposal to protect all aspects of the educational system and freedom of Palestinians. The nonviolent strategies of BBS are among these. It's an activist job where we can all, where we can all have a role, everybody in the room. It's worth supporting BBS. And we can't give up. I mean, I agree with Gabi. There is definitely hope. I'm in my 70s, and I am not about to give up on this struggle. Don't you do it. Good evening. I want to join my colleagues here in thanking the organizers for putting this together. And I also want to thank you all for being here. It's great to see these numbers. And I'm not assuming that everybody here is for BDS, and I'll be talking about that in a second. But what I do want to say is that um, Robin was mentioning that he had been part of several political movements in the past. And I just want to mention that um, I too have been part of several movements in the past. Um, starting with divestment from South Africa when I came here first in the 1980s. And it was slowly, a movement that was slowly, slowly building. And then suddenly it took off on these campuses around the country. And within a few years, South African apartheid was no more. I was part of the East Timor Action Network that was fighting against the uh, Indonesian occupation of East Timor 
which was a, a massive genocide of more than 20% than of the population there. Suddenly, that movement took off, and East Timor is now an independent nation. All my life, I've been part of um, a movement in my own country for civil rights, that is, in Ireland. And for 30 years, people were fighting for some fairly fundamental civil rights in Northern Ireland, which had declared itself a Protestant state for Protestant people. Since the late 1990s, there is now a power-sharing regime in Northern Ireland, and it is no longer a Protestant state for Protestant people. At a certain moment in all these kinds of struggles, you get up in the morning and you sniff the air and you know something's changing. That something irrevocable has happened and that victory is coming. It takes a while, it still takes a lot of organizing, and that's what you're here to do. It still takes a lot of activity, but you know that something has happened, that the corner has been turned, and you're going to win. And I think that's the moment we are in relation to Israeli apartheid. That struggle, we're going to win it. And you can feel it in the air, and I can feel it in this room tonight. So thank you. <laughs> So everybody's already spoken very eloquently about the nature of the Zionist regime and the apartheid it inflicts on people, and I'm not going to dwell on that part. What I really want to do is talk almost technically about the nature of boycotts and why they apply, where they apply, when we should take up the strategy of boycott in order to think about what arguments we still need to present, because you're all here, but there's a whole lot of people out there who have yet to hear about the boycott, let alone to think about why they should get involved with it. So I'm proud to say that boycotts began in Ireland, with Irish people who were being exploited by British landlords boycotting the agent of those landlords, simply by refusing to allow him to come into their shops, to serve him in any way, and so forth. So the boycott is Irish. <laughs> what it is, what a boycott is, is it's a non-violent instrument that aims at expressing moral or political disapproval of some prolonged and ongoing conduct of a person or institution that violates your rights. So it involves withdrawing material or moral or political support to those persons, institutions, or states that are involved. And of course, it's something that is applied in fairly exceptional circumstances. You don't just apply a boycott when you've been offended by someone. You have to think about when you're going to do it. It's different, of course, from sanctions. Sanctions are applied, although that's in the BDS rubric, sanctions need to be applied by governments. And we're closer to getting that done in Europe than we are here, obviously. But that's what sanctions are. They're governmental sanctions against regimes. Divestment, in the same token, is something that we try to, to get corporations to do. We put pressure on them, as the California Divestment Initiative that Shannon Gluck is involved with here, is trying to put pressure on the, um, the, pensions, the California pension system to divest from companies that support the apartheid system and the occupation. So that's divestment. But a boycott is something slightly different, and the boycott is where we, and you particularly, have power to do something. There are circumstances in which it's used so that it's not just simply a general thing that you do whenever you're fed up with somebody. The first, the first condition is that the country or the corporation you're boycotting must in some way be vulnerable to a boycott. So that, for example, trying to boycott China might not be a very wise political strategy, because it's not going to feel it very hard if you decide you're not going to buy things from China. Simply, the place is too big. So that's not the case with Israel. Similarly, it will be very hard for us to organize a boycott of the corporation Caterpillar that supplies Israel with the bulldozers that killed Rachel Corey and which destroyed Palestinian homes on a regular basis. Because we don't buy bulldozers very often, so saying we're going to boycott bulldozers doesn't make much sense. That's why we have divestment. The second condition is that to do a boycott, the country that you're boycotting needs to have a relatively open public sphere. That is, there's no point in boycotting a dictatorship. Even sanctions against Iraq didn't really work because the very people who were most vulnerable to those sanctions, the Iraqi people, had no control over the policy of their government. So that in a certain sense, there must be a sense in the country that they are a democracy. That was the case with South Africa. They believed they were a democracy, a white democracy, of course, but they believed that very strongly. And to be boycotted made them feel that they were not part of the polity of democratic nations around the world. By the same token, although Israel is manifestly another democracy for reasons we can discuss, including the fundamental uh, distinctions it makes in its uh, basic law between citizenship, which everybody has, and nationality, which only Jews have, it is not a democracy, but it claims to be. 
Therefore, to be boycotted by civil society of nations that it respects and wants to be part of is a high, gives it a high sense of vulnerability. Fourthly, the boycott is something that must have been called for explicitly and be desired by those who are occupied or oppressed in that country. We are, in, in the US ACTI organization and the BDS movement worldwide, following the call that was put out by the Palestinian Civil Society in July 2005, in which more than 170 Palestinian civil society organizations, including trades unions, teachers unions, uh, churches, mosques, uh, religious organizations of all kinds, and so forth and so forth, have all participated. So that it is a Palestinian-wide movement, as Roman was saying, not something that has just been imposed by a leadership. And I want to come back to that point in a second. Finally, um, the boycott, or not finally, that's another point, a boycott needs to have very clear goals that the nation or society or the corporation that has been boycotted can actually meet. There's no point in boycotting people and saying you must end all human suffering. You've got to say what it is that you want the people who are being boycotted to do. Now let's be very clear what the goals of the Palestinian BDS movement are. And they are nonviolent, punitive measures that will be maintained until these conditions are met, which fundamentally amount to recognizing the Palestinian people's inalienable right to self-determination and Israel's compliance with international law. Firstly, by ending its occupation and colonization of all Arab lands and by dismantling the separation wall that separates the West Bank from um, the rest of the historic Palestine. Secondly, recognizing the fundamental rights of all Arab Palestinian citizens of Israel to full equality. Now that's very important because it points out that there would be no end to the problem of apartheid if you simply gave the Palestinians on the West Bank some kind of Bantustan-like state. There would still be the condition that a large minority, about 20% of the population of, of Israel, are still disadvantaged in systematic ways. Thirdly, respecting, promoting, and protecting the rights of Palestinian refugees to return to their homes and properties, as stipulated in UN Resolution 194. So the third point is the return of the refugees. Now, it's often said that the return of the refugees would put an end to Israel, as it's presently constituted. That may be true. It's still a UN resolution, and it's still a right under international law that has to be respected. And if anybody has some explaining to do, it's the people who refuse to respect an internationally recognized human right. If that puts an end to a Jewish state for a Jewish people, it's up to Zionists to explain why the nature of that state requires the dispossession and the denial of the rights of, as, as Gabby was pointing out, the descendants of 750,000 people who were ethnically cleansed. So those are the three conditions that, that the boycott is aimed at getting Israel to respect. Uh, another point is that boycotts need to be applied sparingly. You don't just apply boycott at any moment in a political movement because you're bound to fail. Now, similarly, you don't necessarily apply boycotts to any country that happens to be violating human rights. For example, if the U.S. government is, a, is, in, uh, is in a position where it's declaring, for example, China in violation of human rights, or Sudan in violation of human rights or committing genocide, then a boycott is superfluous because civil society is not really in need of acting on those things. It needs to be a situation where, in fact, uh, the activity of civil society, the desire that you have to correct a human rights abuse, is being blocked by your own government. Because boycott is fundamentally a civil society movement, our movement, not a governmental movement. And finally, and this is an important point, boycotts are nonviolent in principle. They do not seek to inflict violence on the, the, oppo the opponent uh, that you are trying to bring to reason. They are designed to be nonviolent. Now, the point about that that I think is extremely instructive in what Robin was saying about his visit is that commitment to a nonviolent movement is fundamentally democratic. Because nonviolent movements, in principle, refuse the idea of leadership, of secrecy. They must operate by transparency and openness. So this is particularly important. And the final point I want to make about boycott uh, is that boycotts don't have to be successful in the sense of achieving the downfall of an economy or the end of a state. What they need to do is influence the public opinion and the political options of the state that they're boycotting irrevocably. Nobody ever thought that the divestment movement from South Africa actually brought De Beers' diamonds to collapse economically. That's not what happened. 
It was the moral pressure that was inflicted by boycott on the South African society at large that brought people to begin to recognize that apartheid had no future. In the same way, you hear sometimes people saying, well, are you going to boycott Intel then, since we make some of the Intel components in Israel? That's not the point. The point is that the infliction of boycott on selected targets, and those targets will vary from area to area in the country, where you can practically affect something, has a cumulative impact on society, primarily not by bringing the economy to its knees, but by sending the message that the practices of apartheid in that country are not acceptable to the rest of the world and will need to change if they are going to be understood not to be pariahs, but part of that Western democratic sphere that they wish to belong to. Now, it's implicit then that uh, the boycott of Israel is applied to Israel because, in a sense, it meets all the conditions I've just laid out for boycott. Israel is, of course, an apartheid state. It's written into the very logic of Zionism that seeks to establish a Jewish state for Jewish people. It's re it has required, as panelists have said, ethnic cleansing of the Palestinian population. And that, that is systematic and not merely a kind of accident of self-defense on the part of Israel. It's not merely that all those terrorists have to be cleared out of the way. It has been the agenda of Zionism since the initial colonization of Palestine. Another reason, of course, why it is so important to engage in the boycott against Israel specifically is that, as Sonia was, was pointing out, discussion of the issue of Israel's uh, war crimes, its crimes against human rights, its imprisonment of 12-year-olds, and so forth and so forth, has been blocked in this country. At the very, very height of Operation Cast Lead, the 2009 invasion and devastation of Gaza, the U.S. Senate and Congress passed a resolution supporting Israel that was for a start mendacious in virtually every clause. If you read the resolution, almost nothing that was said in it was true, including the argument that Palestinians started the conflict. None of it was true. Nonetheless, only four out of the Senate and Congress, only four representatives, were willing to vote against that, that motion. Similarly, with Netanyahu's recent visit, which is about to be repeated, he received standing applause after standing applause. In other words, given that the Obama administration seems unable to take action against the Israeli government, even when they start expanding settlements during Joe Biden's visit, it is quite clear to us that both the Congress and the White House are in lockstep with Israel. That means that our options are blocked. There is no passage through Congress, through our politicians at this point, for us to change U.S.'s relationship to Israel. During a period when your country is giving $3 billion a year, to support Israel, most of which goes into, into weapons, in, which are used to suppress Palestinians. That means that boycott is the only method that we have available to us. The practice of BDS is the only way that is available to American civil society and the global civil society to change Israel's conduct in its violation. Now, finally, uh, I just want to say that, that it is often suggested to those of us who engage in um, in the practice of BDS, the BDS singles out Israel unfairly, and secondly, is anti-Semitic. Now, Sandra has dealt very well with the objections to academic, academic boycott as a, as, a, as a violation of freedom of speech, so I won't go into that one. But I will say something about the charge of anti-Semitism, which I've faced, and probably everybody on this panel, including Gabby, has faced, that we are anti-Semitic <laughs> for, for attacking Israel. It is not anti-Semitic. What is Anti-Semitic is the confusion of being Zionist with being Jewish. In fact, the most egregious racism, the most egregious racism that you can inflict on any person is to say that because they belong to one religious group, ethnic group, or racial group, they must believe certain things. They must identify with that state that is supposedly their representative of the people that they may not object to its conduct that all those people think alike. Secondly, it's not singling out Israel. Robin pointed out that he'd been involved in many political movements. You've heard that Sandra is involved in, in Sudan. Gabby has been involved in many things. I've been involved in many things. There are many, many injustices in the world, and we've been involved in those that we can be involved in, and sometimes you know, partially involved, and sometimes fully involved. But the main point is that just because there are many egregious violations of human rights going around the world, from Darfur to Tibet, does not exonerate Israel from its responsibility to adhere to human rights, particularly when it is your tax money that goes to supporting it to the hilt. 
it's foolish to say that just because there are thieves being prosecuted in Fullerton, that doesn't mean that white collar uh, thieves who have stolen your money out of through the banks should not be prosecuted also. It's quite clear that a crime is a crime is a crime. And that Israel is not to be exonerated from its own violations of human rights just because there are other violators in the world. On the contrary, that there are other violators in the world means that we need to deal with the issue that because of the policy of the United States governments over time is the one that is closest to and for which we bear probably the most responsibility in this country. So if anybody says to you it's anti-Semitic, you know what to say. If anybody says to you you're unfairly singling out Israel, you now know what to say. <laughs> now, what I hope is that because you're here, you are here to commit yourself, and this is the gospel moment, you know, where you come down to the front and we anoint you. Um, what I hope is that you're here to commit yourself to certain practices that involve boycott, divestment, and sanctions. And there are some simple things that you can do. The good people at, uh, in the CSU have shown you see the way by beginning to launch a boycott of the education abroad programs at CSU, which are starting up again. They were suspended for a while because of the State Department's suggestion that there was danger to people visiting Israel-Palestine during a certain period, and now in both UC and CSU, these education abroad programs are being reinstated. Now, it's important to know that if you are of Arab descent, if you are Lebanese, if you are Syrian, if you are Palestinian, and you go with one of these education abroad programs to Israel, you are extremely likely to be stopped at the border and subjected to humiliating search, even arrest and detention. Now, I say that because, not because I made it up, but because that's what the State Department's website says. There is a warning on the State Department's website. You go there, you will find it. It takes a bit of searching. They don't put this in big headlines, but it's there. And indeed, Donna Shalala. Anybody remember Donna Shalala? Okay, right. In the Clinton administration, now president of Miami University, went on a delegation of university presidents on a voyage to Israel to collaborate with Israeli universities. So she was on this VIP trip, but she decided, being of Lebanese descent, that she'd visit some friends who happened to be living in Israel. And she was dropped off at the airport in Tel Aviv. And when she was dropped off at the airport in Tel Aviv, she went to check in, and she was taken aside and detained for an unspecified length of time by the Israeli authorities. Why? Because she's Lebanese. Now, she hadn't seen fit to protest this, but I think maybe we should protest such things because they have also been happening to students of our descent who are going on these education abroad programs. So I think this is a very, very important initiative that you could start here, right here at UCLA by investigating what happens to students who go to Israel on these education abroad programs, which are on their face discriminatory and therefore against the written policies of UC and every other university I know of in the country. The second thing you can do is get involved in the California Divestment Initiative, and there is a uh, little letter that you can sign outside at the table um, asking the California pension funds to divest from companies that do business that, with Israel that substantially supports the occupation, the apartheid wall, and segregation. And thirdly, as uh, has already been mentioned by Robin, there's the case of Veolia. Um, and I hope that you will also join the campaign against Veolia. It's pretty simple. Bus number two goes straight from here downtown. You can hop on that. It's not run by Veolia, so you're OK. And you can hop off downtown, uh, and within an hour you're there from UCLA, and you can join the protest. So hopefully we'll see you there at the protest. So pick up the little flyer and be there. Thank you very much. Uh, our panel once again and uh, thank you all for being here.